Welcome, colleagues uh, and members, to the Devolution for the Powers Committee, our 27th meeting of 2015. Um, agenda item one um, is, first of all, uh, to decide whether we're going to take a couple of items of business in private. Agenda item number three involves consideration of amendments made to the Scotland Bill at report stage in the House of Commons on Monday, the 9th of November. And agenda item four involves consideration of a draft committee guide to devolution in Scotland. Can I ask members if they agree to taking items three and four in private? Yes. Thank you, colleagues. Um, agenda item two, a second item on business, is taking evidence on the Scottish Parliament Elections Order 2015. We have a panel of witnesses to provide evidence on the order. And all of these panel members have got huge titles after their name. So I'm just going to read out each individual's name on this occasion, just to save some time. Gordon Blair, and from West Lothian Council, Ian Milton, from Grampian Assessors and Electoral Registration Office, Andrew O'Neill, from the Electoral Commission, and Mary pitt from the Electoral Management Board of Scotland. Uh, I don't intend to take any opening statements this morning, folks. Um, I'd like to try and do this in about 40 minutes, if we can achieve it, because we've got a lot to get through on our agenda today. But can I just begin by opening uh, and saying thank you for coming along, first of all, obviously, but beginning opening a very general question about what changes have been made in this order compared with the 2015 order, which governed the administration of elections in 2011. Just in general terms, I think that would be the best way, because I know it's a very hefty order. Who'd like to take that one? Mary, you look as though you're I can, full of anticipation. Uh, deal with that, Convener. Um, I think members of the committee have the submission that the Electoral Management Board has made, and we highlight there the changes that have been made since we engaged with civil servants in relation to the drafting of the order. Uh, I should begin by saying we were very grateful for the opportunity to be involved at that early stage, and we're, um, also we welcome very much the fact that the discussions we've had have led to some of these changes. The main ones I would highlight relating to um, our, our agreement that we should be putting the interests of the voter first relate to um, being able to issue postal votes earlier than was previously um, allowed for at the last time we had these polls, being able to replace uh, lost postal vote packs earlier than was previously the case, um, also giving us the power to advise voters, postal voters who have not completed their postal voting statement properly. Uh, giving them uh, notice of that, telling them that that was the case so that they can avoid making the same mistakes in future uh, and losing their vote at, at any other election. Uh, the specific requirement in relation to voters being able to uh, join a queue if there is such a thing in a polling station at 10pm. Uh, another one relates to commonly used names, an issue that caused some of us quite a lot of uh, concern at the time of the last general election, but has been now resolved in this order, and specifically one that has uh, engaged me in the past around the issue of employment of staff who may have been associated with a particular um, cam candidate or campaign. Um, the, other, the, the other one is relatively minor in relation to electronic submission of notices, and again, we welcome that. So we're comfortable with uh, all of these changes uh, and indeed welcome them uh, having been taken on board. Thank you. I'm particularly welcoming the change of name issue, yeah. uh, particularly given my first name is Robert, but I'm known as Bruce, so it'll make it much clearer for people <laughs> in future. I'm delighted by that particular move. Not that Bruce is necessarily an uncommon name in Scotland. Sorry, I've probably given away far too much information. <laughs> um, but can also can you just give us a feel about that consultation process as well that happened between the various electoral administrators uh, and the, the Scottish Government, just to see how deep that was and how meaningful it was? Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, I, I can do that from the perspective of the Electoral Commission uh, convener. Uh, I mean, obviously. Uh, We've had lots of discussions with the Scottish Government. Uh, we welcome the revision of the order. Uh, we think the order builds on a lot of the recommendations we've made since uh, 2011, uh, which we include in various of our uh, reports on various elections. Uh, particularly interested in uh, the absent voting statement, Form V. There's lots of colleagues in the Electoral Commission are happy that they've revised that. I won't go into detail of what that is, but uh, it allows us to collect lots of data post the event. I would particularly welcome Scottish Government's uh, involvement with us in the sense that they never received, because the order 
the provisions of the 2012 Scotland Act weren't commenced until the 1st of July. They were speaking to us well before 1st of July. In fact, they informally consulted us on the draft at that stage and then subsequently uh, formally consulted us once they had the power, but also in particular uh, with regards to the uh, the exemptions for disability ex ex exemptions for candidates. Uh, our lawyers and Scottish Government lawyers have spent I think considerable hours working together to try and make that work. So I think the depth of involvement in this order from the Commission's perspective uh, is, is lengthy and, and been, uh, has added value to the order. I also want to reflect on that, Gordon. Your general point about uh, consultation. Um, from Solar's perspective, we have an elections working group and representatives of the Scottish Government, Scotland Office and the Electoral Commission are there. Chatham House rules apply, free and frank exchange of views and and informs everybody, and we're delighted that uh, the outcome of that is, uh, is reflected to a very great extent in the resulting order. So the consultation, from our perspective, was, was excellent. Stuart, did you have a uh, supplementary? Uh, I'll come back to you later okay. in that case. Uh, I Duncan. Follow, follow up on some of that, and uh, you know, the, the, the written evidence does, I think, broadly uh, commend the consultation, etc. But I, I, I'm looking at the electoral commissions. Um, uh, written um, uh, evidence and, and it says, call me an old cynic I, I don't know whether there's just a wee hint that there are things that are not resolved but we continue to recommend that all legislation should be clear whether the Royal Assent of the Bill and the introduction, the introduction of second legislation in Parliament so I don't know why we're being drawn to that or why I've been drawn to that we continue to recommend is there a, is there a, a, a an indication there that that is an issue that's not been resolved. And the, 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 other, the other one about in terms of clear legislation well in advance, it then goes on to say there will, however, be less time to ensure that guidance for campaigners is available in good time before the start of the regulated period, May 2016. Now, given that that has, you know, the, the guidance for campaigners and, you know, recently and in you know, that, that people are conducting themselves and understand clearly. That's and it's a highly political and publicised area if, if, if campaigners get, get that wrong. So uh, are these areas that are still uh, not resolved to your satisfaction? Uh, firstly, I, I think the first point I would make is what we want is clear legislation and we're, we're happy with the order as it is. Uh, we, would, we want it, obviously, now rather than later. Uh, clear legislation to us is defined by knowing what it will be six months before the electoral event. Uh, the order was laid on the 4th of November, so it actually does hit uh, six months in terms of uh, clear. Uh, obviously, if you didn't pass the legislation, uh, assuming you didn't bring another one in, we would have the legislation as currently is. So, in that sense, it's clear. Uh, our difficulties in terms of telling people what the legislation is, is the fact that we have the duty to provide, as you know, uh, guidance to parties, candidates and agents. We would normally provide that three months before the beginning of the regulated period, which is the 5th of January. Uh, so we are a little bit late on that, but we have been doing things, briefings at party conferences and such like, which many of you uh, will, will have seen from your own uh, uh, attendance at party conferences. We will ensure that candidates and agents are particularly aware of the changes in the regulatory frameworks for can candidates and agents, particularly in respect of the disability aspects which have changed. So we, we will highlight that in the guidance. The guidance we will produce uh, by hopefully by the end of the year. Well, obviously, we have to wait until uh, we've, we've, we've got the, rev the revisions and we can change all the guidance. Uh, in terms of electoral admin guidance, we've produced some of it and we'll produce the rest of it either end of the year or the beginning of, uh, beginning of the next year. So, not ideal, but you're managing the process? Yes. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Tavish. Thank you. Can I just ask, um, Andy uh, O'Neill, about the regulated period? You mean the Commission previously recommended that we should move to one regulated period, which I think makes quite some considerable sense as a point of view of a of people involved in this process. Why do you think that recommendation hasn't been accepted as yet? Uh, 
firstly, it's a, it's a question which the Scottish Government would have to ask, not uh, answer, rather than ourselves. I mean, we recommended uh, moving to a single regulated period back in 2011. Uh, they've chosen not to do that. The impact is uh, donations in what's known as the long period uh, for candidates will not uh, be recorded. That caused some confusion in our, uh, when we analysed this back in 2011, in the sense that we had candidates recording donations in the short period. Uh, there was a lack of transparency uh, because they could, couldn't record them. Some people chose to, some people didn't. Uh, so we, we suggested one period. They haven't gone for that. I suspect uh, it's been a matter of uh, time to actually achieve uh, changes. Uh, but again, it's for Scottish Government to... But that was four on. years ago you recommended this, and you know, other things have moved a lot more quickly than Indeed, that. Indeed, yes, and they've and accepted... You said we've had lots of jolly good discussions with frank and full exchanges with the civil service and all the rest of it. Well, obviously not on this one. Again, yes. Uh, I don't think it's uh, a question of their opposed to the principle. I think there was a time factor involved in this, and as we all know, uh, there's been lots of electoral referendum legislation post-2011 through to here. So... Uh, I suspect it's a time matter. Okay. But we will, obviously, we report on the administration of the election uh, and we will look at this and we will analyse the returns which we get from candidates yeah. to see if this continues. Okay, thank you. Okay, and Andy, are we absolutely clear that there's, there are no legal impediments here or no issues about reserve and devolved issues at play? as far as the Scottish Government's view is concerned on this? I think in terms of being able to uh, require donations by candidates in the long period, mm -hmm. uh, our view is, and we can confirm this in, in writing to the committee, that the ability to legislate for donations in the long period is devolved. Uh, I think we... We, and this is one of the reasons why other things haven't been able to be done. We have spent a lot of time talking with Scottish Government lawyers around the definition of personal expenses for uh, excluding that for people with disabilities. And that has proved very complicated because candid candidates on party lists is reserved because it comes under papera, whereas candidate personal expenses in constituency and individual candidates on the list is devolved. So it's proved very difficult to legislate for that. And I think that has led to literally uh, not, not enough time to actually do other things. Does that not mean it's the same then for donations? My understanding is no, but okay. we can confirm that. Um, the other point I would like to ask is, what, what, what discussions has the Electoral Commission had with the political parties on that issue? Because before anything could happen in that area, inevitably, and I'll ask the same question to the Minister when he comes in front of me, what discussions have the government had with political parties in that area? What discussions have the Electoral Commission had with them? In terms of donations in the long period, I mean, we published our report back way back in 2011 and talked to parties via the political parties panel all the time on this, and I am aware that the Scottish Government did consult uh, parties on uh, changes to donations in the long period. There is a question of, to be fair and open, uh, if you change, and this is coming back to our duty to provide guidance, uh, if you change the law and you don't give people an adequate period of time in which to understand the changes of the law, uh, it, it may prove difficult for candidates and parties. Uh, changing donations in the long period could mean that candidates may have collected donations and not checked permissibility if it's over £500 uh, and use them in the long period, which, which they shouldn't do because they may be impermissible. Now, the amount of occasions when a candidate will get over £500 and has to check permissibility uh, may be small, but there is a, there is a slight element of uh, should you legislate and not, ha not have the ability to tell the candidates what the law is before the law comes in. And I, I know certainly one party has pointed that out to Scottish Government. Um, okay, I, I could pro prolong this, but... but I don't think I will. Um, 
Malcolm. Um, I've just got one question, really. I'm, obviously, with the, the, the law having been changed in regard to 16- and 70-year-olds, I'm wondering what progress has been made with regard to the registration of 16- and 17-year-olds for the Scottish Parliament election. Yes, I, I, if I can answer that. Uh, but uh, just before I answer that, can I also state that uh, um, you asked a question about stakeholder consultation. And uh, as far as electoral registration officers uh, are concerned, it went extremely well at both formal and informal uh, levels with Scottish Government. Uh, so uh, uh, that's, that's that point, uh, if you like. The, um, as far as the 16 and 17-year-olds, uh, the work is ongoing. The canvas uh, concludes on the 1st of December, but the actual registration activity will continue uh, right through uh, and until the 18th of April, which is the deadline for registration for participants in the uh, Scottish parliamentary election. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, going, it's going well, uh, there's a lot of work to be done and um, there's, there's a complex point uh, which, um, it, uh, on, in terms of messaging in that in, until the 1st of December has passed, uh, the, the message has to be put out that people can, who are 15 uh, by the 30th of November uh, this year can register to vote. After the 1st of December, it'll be 14-year-olds and upwards. So there's a, a slight messaging complexity, but it's not, a, it's, not, it's not something that's going to cause us too much difficulty. And we're working well with the education authorities, uh, so we're getting the uh, lists of young people as well to help us verify their, their applications. So the, the process is working well at present. And in terms of 14- and 15-year-old attainers, is that, is that what you're referring to then, or, or, or what about people who are coming on stream a bit later than... No, no. From, 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 from at, at present, anybody who is 15 uh, and meets the other criteria uh, by the 30th of November this year may apply to register to vote and have their names uh, included uh, as registered electors on the 1st of December revised registers. After the 1st of December, uh, electoral registration officers can actually accept applications from 14-year-olds uh, and onwards. Okay. Point. On that, you mentioned that the consultation with the Scottish Government went very, very, very well. Um, but you raised the issue of, of the, the electoral registration officer expenses under that heading in your written submission um, and draw our attention to the, um, the MS estimated Scottish Parliament general election costs in May 2016. But note that that, that, that uh, does not... It remains silent on registration costs. Is that something you, you raised with the government in your consultation? It's something that um, we didn't raise in the, uh, in the consultation, stakeholder consultation response. It wasn't really part of the stakeholder consultation response. Uh, the uh, issue I've raised simply just now is that uh, in light of the uh, response, uh, I think it was to Mark McDonald's uh, question, uh, earlier on in this parliament in September this year, John Swinney uh, reported that the total cost for electoral registration officers over and above their normal budgetary arrangements for providing registration services year round was, uh, I think, 1.042 million. It is brought to the committee's attention. Sorry? It's a significant issue. You, you felt it important enough to draw to the committee's attention. Well, the financial implications are silent on, on, on that particular point, yes. Ah, but but you, 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 you point to the additional cost of if, if it's as busy as the referendum and the, you know, uh, that much is what is the estimated cost or what sort of just to get a scale of this what, what, what costs are we talking about here is it significant is it well the, the, the answer that John Swinney gave was that the cost uh, the additional cost for registration officers in uh, providing services for the independence referendum was £1.04 million pounds, uh, over and above their normal business as usual budgets which they uh, acquire from local authorities. So uh, if we have the same level of engagement, uh -huh. then we could anticipate a similar uh, additional cost of around about £1 million. Pounds. Uh, if we so don't have the same level of engagement... Currently there's a concern, if you get the same level of turnout and uh, there's, there's a shortfall of 1.4 well, the, the million that's not been addressed. 1.04. Uh, potentially. 
I mean, at the end of the day, the, the order uh, makes provision for local authorities to fund electoral registration officers. They require that under Article 24, I think. But uh, uh, it's really a case of the, the financial implications of the Scottish parliamentary election um, will include, potentially, that sort of sum of money. But that will have to be sourced, essentially, through local authorities. And I think it's important that, is, uh, that everybody's aware that there is that potential. So is the dialogue still continuing in regards to that? Uh, there's no active dialogue at present on that. Uh, um, we're, we're obviously waiting to see uh, how the budget setting round goes this, uh, this winter. Okay. Okay, Is anyone else respond to that? No? No, it's OK. I thought Mary was going to say something. Linda? Yeah, just a general question. I, I just wanted a, an update on the progress of individual voter registration. The uh, canvas is progressing uh, in that regard. Uh, the canvas uh, commenced in Scotland on 1st of August and concludes on 1st of December. Uh, the canvas is essentially a two-stage process now, uh, which uh, you know will raise. Um, you know, um, uh, we need to raise awareness about the fact that it is a two-stage process, uh, and we've doing, been doing a lot of work with the Electoral Commission. Uh, and uh, the Electoral Management Board and ourselves to make sure that that, that message is understood. Mm -hmm. But essentially, the canvas is progressing well Good. in terms of getting the, canvas, the household inquiry forms back. Uh, the household inquiry forms, in, in the old days of traditional canvas, that was where the job finished, and electoral registration officers would list, lift the information from the canvas forms and update their registers by adding names who were added to the canvas form, deleting names that were removed from the canvas form. Uh, now, uh, there's a second stage to that process. Uh, if the name is removed, we've got to find a, another piece of evidence to support removal of that name from the register, and we can find that through cooperation with uh, local authorities providing us with data, uh, or else conducting a review. To add a name to the register, the, uh, uh, we need to uh, have an application from the individual to actually make uh, that uh, registration uh, so, in that re respect, there is a second stage to the canvas, and that won't all be complete uh, in, in, in entirety in terms of, uh, because we will have some electors who won't necessarily follow up, making the, responding to the invitation to actually register uh, in time for the 1st of December registers. But apart from that, the canvas is, uh, is, is working, working well. I, I think that's my concern, is those that don't follow up, that just ignore the things that come through the door. Uh, what happens to these people? Well, the position is, with both the household inquiry form and any subsequent invitation to register that an electoral registration officer issues, is that there is a follow-up procedure. Uh, and the follow-up procedure is, is two reminders and also a visit to the, to the, to the address by electoral registration officer canvas staff. Uh, so in that regard, um, you know, there's, uh, there's plenty of follow-up uh, in that regard. And, um, you know, so we're, we're working on that just now. Thank you. Yes, please. I just wonder uh, how this works in uh, county constituencies, uh, whilst it might be possible for visits to be easily uh, arranged in the towns. Mm -hmm. Is this going to be universal in Scotland? Oh, yes. Uh, I, mean, I mean, the law applies to every electoral registration officer uh, across Scotland uh, and, indeed, in fact, England and Wales as well. So, uh, in that regard, we're all working on the same framework uh, to try and provide a consistent registration service across, across all areas. Uh, in my area, uh, there's both an urban and a rural element to it. And uh, we, we receive funding from, uh, from, from the Westminster government to actually uh, employ or additional canvas staff, and that's what we've done. The second point is, at this stage, can you give us any estimate of how many people are still to be uh, carried over uh, onto the new register and uh, to be signed up in this uh, process where there's been any uh, failure to follow up from the first invitation to the second one? Uh, I, I can't give uh, any estimate um, you know, today. Uh, we're working on this uh, day by day just now. Uh, we, we don't conclude the canvas essentially until the 1st of December. Um, but if, if, for example, we get a canvas form back um, uh, next week or the following week uh, with a name added to it, maybe in, res in response to a second reminder for the canvas form, uh, and there's a new name to be added to the register, 
Uh, if they don't apply within 28 days, we will have to issue an invitation to register. Uh, we won't wait the 28 days normally. We will issue an invitation to register. Now, that invitation to register might not be completed and returned prior to the 1st of December, so that person won't actually be added until maybe the January update to the register. Uh, so uh, the process is very dynamic and ongoing, and it's, it's, it's almost impossible to take a snapshot at any one time and come up with any, any meaningful uh, sort of uh, assessment. Obviously, I'm looking at the management stats uh, on a daily basis in my own office, but uh, it would be very difficult, it would be quite a leap to, to transfer that to an estimate of where we... point at which it would be possible to make an estimate of uh, the number of people who have... Uh, whether it's increased or decreased uh, since the last electoral event? The, um, the 1st of December. I mean, some, some electoral management software will not actually provide the final electorate until uh, you actually, uh, the electoral registration officer, asks for their registers to be run. Uh, and, and that will vary depending on the electoral management software. But um, given that it's a two-stage process in this canvas, uh, and so some additions won't actually be uh, uh, made, in, given the scenario I've just given you, uh, until possibly after the 1st of December. I think we've got to bear that in mind, uh, in that this is really, as, as I see it, electoral registration is moving from an annual canvas and a refresh and a revised register to a year-round constant updating and uh, real-time updating of the register. Yeah, just... Uh Quick cl uh, clarification on that. I'm pleased to hear everything you said there, Ian. In relation to visits to houses uh, you know, that haven't made the returns, how long would you intend these to be in place? Well, uh, with, with, given that we're issuing invitations to register year-round now, yeah. uh, canvassing will be continuing year-round, following up of invitations to register. Uh, so, in my own uh, authorities area, I've employed... Uh, canvases on, uh, on, you know, on, on full 12-month contra contracts. Right. So okay. that, uh, because it, I see it now as a year-round process. Right, so somebody may get a visit in February next year yes, that for would example, enable if, them to be registered for the Absolutely. The if, if, right. if somebody moves house and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and they advise the local authority uh, that they've moved house so the council tax record is, is updated, then I will get notice of that and I will keep an eye on the register at that address. Uh -huh. And if they don't make an online application to register, then I will issue an invitation to right. register. Okay. Once I've issued the invitation to register, then I am obliged to make two reminders if I don't get a response and a house call if I don't get a response. Right. Thank you very much. So it will continue year-round. Stuart McMill. Uh, thank you. Just, uh, <coughs> just a point of uh, clarification. Uh, ben, you mentioned a few moments ago, Mr. Lockham, to the, the Malcolm Chisholm's question regarding the 16-year-old, uh, uh, and you, you said that uh, there has been a good, uh, good uh, kind of working with the education authorities. Uh, previously, uh, when we went through the referendum, I raised the issue of working with likes of Skills Development Scotland and colleges uh, to, for registration purposes too. I mean, is that happening as well in this in this instance? Uh, comment on Skills Development Scotland. But I can certainly comment on uh, tertiary education uh, uh, providers in that we're working with them, yes, uh, and, and we're receiving data, yes. Okay. As part of the 16-, uh, 17-year-olds uh, registration campaign, which we ran and will continue running uh, until the 18th of April next year, uh, we worked with Skills Development Scotland as part of one of our partnerships. And Skills Development Scotland tweeted three times to all their clients, which is some 30, 38,000 people, uh, about registration messages for 16, 17-year-olds. And we're working with NUS uh, Scotland and University Scotland to ensure that they're getting messages about registration out as well. And I, I would say, to, to sort of complement what Ian was saying as well, I think he's, the Commission agrees with them. The 1st December isn't the end of the story in terms of electoral registration. The, the work just simply continues. We have public awareness plans leading up to the deadline for registration of 18th of April, which we will pursue, and we're working with lots, including uh, Ian's electoral registration colleagues, partners, to ensure that as many people who wish to be registered are registered. And perhaps I could just add to that the work that education authorities have been doing with the Commission uh, and with electoral registration officers across the country has, I think, been very uh, has, has been a very good start to that. We had registration week in September when the schools were back uh, after the summer break. 
Um, we've been actively trying to encourage people who are at school uh, and who could uh, register to vote to do so. But we've also, for example, on my authority, we have hundreds of young people who are um, working with our employment and training unit who get those young people into apprenticeships, etc. Now, they are going to specifically speak to those young people who are 16 and 17-year-olds who have left school. But we're also working uh, with our community learning and development teams to make sure that they're also talking to young people who might not get the message at school. There are obviously school leavers who would be entitled to vote as well, and we're trying to make sure that they understand how they can register and encourage them to do so. OK, sure. Yeah. Mark okay. MacDonald. Yeah, <clears throat> just a uh, couple of questions, convener, just following some of the... Um, points raised in the, the EMB uh, evidence. The first was around um, notification to postal voters who have submitted incorrect or incomplete postal voting statements. I just wondered, uh, just, just as a rough idea, as to how much of an issue that is currently in, in elections in terms of the numbers that are rejected as a result of incorrect or incomplete statements. Um, I would... I wouldn't be able to give you a figure for the whole of Scotland, but we can certainly look for that information and, and provide it to the committee if you would find that um, useful. But I would say it's less of a problem than it has been, uh, you know, uh, because we are now able, after particular elections, to tell people that they've been not filling in their date of birth, they've put the date that they signed the form, for example, very common mistake, or they haven't used their... Um, they haven't... Uh, signed it in the same way as they signed their application, for example. Uh, they've maybe used a, a new name if they've got married, for example, and that's not the name that was on their application. So there's all sorts of reasons for the um, form not being properly completed. But I think the fact that we can now go out afterwards, or at least the electoral registration officers can go out afterwards and tell them, um, is, is helpful and is helping to, to stop that, uh, that happening. The rates of postal vote rejection... Mr O'Neill has just told me, uh, have been reducing, so I'm glad that was what I, I uh, understood as well. So that if we look back to the Scottish parliamentary elections in 2011, the rejection rate was 5.9%. Uh, earlier this year, at the general election, 2.9%. And in the Scottish independence referendum, only 2.7%. So you can see there's a decline, but obviously we'd like to get everybody to, to fill the form in properly so that their vote can be included in the, in the count. In, in, indeed, and um, those are welcome statistics, especially as I suspect over that period of time the number of people registered for postal votes has gone up, because I'm aware there, has <laughs> been a, there, have, there have been drives to, to encourage individuals onto a postal vote because of the, the more likely event of them turning out. I just wonder, on the, on the issue of, the, of signatures not matching, what allowance or otherwise can be afforded, particularly for individuals with disabilities, where it can be very difficult for them to replicate signatures uh, more than, on more than one occasion? What, what allowances are provided in that regard? In that regard, if, if I may say, what the situation is that uh, the applications for absent voting come into the Electoral Registration Officer, and uh, if there is a, a problem with providing a signature or, the, uh, or a signature is inconsistent, uh, then we can offer a signature waiver which means that a signature doesn't have to be provided uh, in, in, in circumstances as long as the electoral registration officer is satisfied that there is good reason. But that must be made uh, essentially at the application. So uh, uh, it, it's, it, it wouldn't work if somebody decides when they decide to cast their postal vote that they can't give a consistent signature. It's too late then. It really has to be, the arrangement has to be made in advance. But it's, 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 it's a perfect situation for people who suffer and, stroke and, and disability. And in the follow-up information, so, so let's say, for example, an individual registers, does not say at the time that as a result of their disability they may have difficulty replicating their signature, their postal ballot is rejected as a consequence. When you follow up, is the information around that included within that follow-up information? You know, if, if this is a result of a disability, here is a step you can take. Yes, and, and, and the feedback is good. And, 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 in fact, the number of waiver applications has increased, but I don't have the stats in front of me. Yes, I've certainly seen a growing number of people who have a, a waiver, but it's still a relatively small number. But I would um, stress that returning officers and their staff who do this piece of work uh, when postal votes are, open, are opened um, have all had training um, from the forensic science uh, people who can tell us about what to look out for in terms of forged signatures and we take it very very seriously so there would be no way in which any capricious decision would be made that the you know the the um the, the, the signature just doesn't look the same we'd look at it very very carefully following pen path and 
all, all sorts of uh, all sorts of advice we've had. So it's it's really a very serious decision for us to take that somebody's signature just simply does not match no, uh, I, I, that that they gave previously. I, I would expect nothing less. Um, <laughs> in terms of the other issue. Uh, a note in terms of uh, voters in a queue at close of poll, I realise one of the, the sort of defining images of a recent general election was of voters at a certain polling station being turned away at, at, at close of poll. But also, uh, I know it says that um, planning for sufficient polling facilities, also in terms of the actual polling facilities themselves, what guidance is offered in terms of size requirements based on the number of individuals who will be voting at that polling station? Yes, we have a... We have a, a an exercise within the Electoral Management Board of um, working out what we think the anticipated turnout would be, and we take into account all sorts of things, including um, you know, the comments that people might be making in the media around what they expect turnout to be. And on, that ba on the basis of that assessment, we would issue advice to returning officers about the maximum number of voters who could vote at each polling station. So for the Scottish Independent referendum, because we were anticipating a, a very high turnout, we recommended that no more than 800 voters per station should be the, the norm. Uh, that was followed by every returning officer, and we had a very, very high turnout, but no um, complaints about queuing and certainly nothing at the end of the day. Um, for the general election, we thought the turnout might be a bit less, so we um, recommended that no more than 1,000 electors per station um, be uh, allowed or be provided for, be planned for. And again, that was followed, and that also gave us good throughput on the day, so we, the stations operated efficiently. Um, I, I am aware that that's not always the case um, in some other parts of the UK, where larger numbers of electors may be scheduled to, um, to each polling station. And you know, the risk there is that you, you know, that may lead to queues, either at busy times of the day or towards the end of the day, if people decide to wait till the last minute. And we are very anxious yeah. that that doesn't become a feature in Scottish elections. And in, and in terms of use of venue, um, I know in some local authorities there has been a move to try and move away from the use of schools where possible, um, because obviously it then doesn't mean that you have to you close the school on that day. Is, that, is, th is there any general guidance in relation to venues to be used, or is it very much at the discretion of local authorities as to which venues they use? It is for the local authority to uh, determine the polling places. It is for the returning officer then to determine the number of polling stations within that polling place. I am um, not aware of any guidance in determining polling places other than the Electoral Commission guidance that it should be accessible to those who are able and those also with a disability. Uh, those who are able is a geographic consideration of those with disability is actually getting in and out of the premises. Um, the, in terms of the suitability of polling places, yes, there's a move away from schools for obvious reasons, uh, uh, but uh, my experience is that uh, we use community wings, we don't, keep, we don't close the school, we uh, take special arrangements to segregate the playground so there's no risks to the children, for example. And we, we minimise the number of schools we have to use, but the bottom line sometimes is there is no physical building in a locality other than the local primary school or whatever to run the poll for that day. Uh, but uh, uh, if there's any suitable alternative, then there's clear recommendations go into the councils, and uh, uh, certainly in my experience, uh, uh, the councils have uh, decided that uh, a school has to be used because there is no suitable alternative for polling purposes and that for that day, for that purpose, is the primary concern, the access of voters, able and disabled. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Johnson, I will leave the last question to you. Thank you very much. One of the things that comes up quite often when you're a candidate knocking on doors during an election is the issue yeah. of like, later last yeah. minute registration for yeah, absent yeah. votes. Uh, is the processes that are going to be adopted uh, through this uh, order uh, likely to change the date on, uh, on which last minute votes can be uh, achieved uh, or uh, are we going to have any uh, changes there basically? The, uh, the position is, with this order is, uh, is that the, we've got this standard framework of deadlines that we have for other elections in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So that's very useful indeed. Originally, there was a, a suggestion in the uh, uh, stakeholder consultation stage that the deadlines might be different for proxies and uh, applications mm -hmm. and things like that. But uh, I'm really pleased that the representations were 
which we made have been uh, you know, reflected in the order that's been laid before Parliament. So it's, uh, the, we've got very standard uh, deadlines uh, that um, apply throughout all yeah. elections. The difference uh, this time, of course, being... And this is the first Scottish Parliament election where you've got online registration. So you'll be able to do that until up to midnight on the 18th of April, whereas yep. previously it was paper. Mm -hmm. And these deadlines are effectively uh, as late as they can practically be. Is that what you're suggesting? Um, well, I, I, I would. They, they're in line with uh, with all elections that we have at present uh, in operation in Scotland, uh, which is very good from a case of voter messaging uh, and understanding. Um, uh, there's always uh, a pressure to uh, move things back almost to the point of saying, well, you know, polling day uh, registration. Uh, that's a, that, that creates all sorts of issues, uh, and uh, we don't have that at present. Yeah. I will remain unsurprised when on the 19th or the 20th of April I meet people who say they didn't know there was an election. <laughs> <laughs> to add for that, will we run a public awareness campaign to try and ensure that they do understand that the deadline for registration uh, is the 18th of April and we will be doing TV, radio, online and we will be sending a leaflet to all households in Scotland uh, with those messages in it. Mm -hmm. I don't have evidence on this particular order. I wanted to do this in 40 minutes. I'm now over that because I know the level of business we've got to get through today. Um, thank you, the witnesses, for coming along today. I'm very grateful to you. Uh, we'll next be taking evidence in this order from the Minister of Parliamentary Business on the 26th of November before deciding whether to approve the order at that meeting. Uh, we now move into private session. Thank you.